Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. It's a great pleasure to speak in this seminar series. Uh, so I will talk about some uh, recent joint work with Hank Bui and John Keating on the ratios conjecture over function fields. Um, so I will start with some discussion of the uh, ratios conjecture in the number field setting. Uh, and before the ratios conjecture, uh, there was this conjecture of David Farmer from 1993, uh, where he's looking at quotients of um, two zeta functions over two zeta functions. So here the parameter S uh, is on the uh, critical line, so on the line with real particle to one half. And we have these small shifts, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, which are of size roughly one over log T. Uh, um, and we're integrating this up to height t. Um, the parameters, the shifts have uh, all real uh, positive real parts. And then uh, Farmer made this conjecture about uh, these quotients of zeta functions. And it turns out that this conjecture has many interesting applications. For example, uh, Farmer noticed that uh, this conjecture would imply the pair correlation conjecture of Montgomery. Uh, which essentially says that the local statistics of uh, zero, uh, the local statistics of zeros of the Riemann zeta function are given by the corresponding uh, statistics of uh, eigenvalues of matrices from the GUE ensemble in random matrix theory. So these kind of applications uh, sparked the interest in looking at conjectures of this type, and uh, later. Um, uh, this conjecture was uh, refined by Conry Farmer and Zernbauer by adapting the so-called recipe, which was used previously by Conry Farmer, Keating, Rubinstein, and Snaith to make uh, conjectures uh, for moments of L functions. So I will discuss a little bit the ideas behind the recipe a bit later on in the talk. Uh, basically, they used some number theory, uh, theoretic heuristic arguments to make predictions both about uh, moments and about these kind of ratios. So uh, the ratios conjecture is very uh, general. I will just give a few examples. Uh, so this is uh, the form the conjecture takes um, when we're looking at uh, quotients of uh, zeta functions. So again, we have two zeta functions over two zeta functions. Uh, this is the same quantity that Farmer looked at. And this conjecture is more general in the sense that it includes um, and these uh, lower order terms. So we have these arithmetic factors given by Euler products. And uh, the ratios conjecture predicts everything down to square root cancellation. So here, uh, maybe I should say that uh, there are maybe no very good reasons to expect square root cancellation, but at least a power saving error term. And they conjectured that this uh, should hold um, again when uh, the shifts in the denominator, so gamma, delta have real parts bigger than one over log T. So we can be very close to the critical line. Um, we need the real parts to be less than one quarter. Uh, this is just to ensure that the, the Euler product converges. And we need the imaginary parts to be up to t to the one minus epsilon. Um, so this is one form of the conjecture. This is the simplest case when we have two zeta functions over two zeta functions. Uh, in fact, this holds more generally, they can take any product of zeta functions over any product of zeta functions. And in fact, this holds for uh, families of L functions as well. So not just for the zeta function. And in this talk, I will uh, mostly focus on the family of quadratic L functions. So um, I want to show you what the conjecture says for the family of quadratic L functions. So here we have the character chi d. Uh, this is the quadratic character. We are summing over the discriminant D. Let's say that we're summing over uh, fundamental discriminants so that uh, the characters are primitive. And we have uh, one L function over one L function. And we have these small shifts, alpha and beta. Then uh, the conjecture predicts, again, everything down to square root cancellation or down to a power saving error term. And we, uh, we have these arithmetic factors A of alpha beta. Uh, given again in terms of an Euler product, the Euler product is different than what we had for the Riemann zeta function. Um, and the conditions are um, 
so we have the shift bigger than one over log x, uh, where x is roughly the size of the family. So if we're summing over fundamental discriminants of size up to x, we have roughly a constant times x such discriminants. So the real part of the shift in the denominator must be bigger than one over log of the size of the family. Uh, less than one quarter. We also want the shift in the numerator to be less than one quarter for convergence reasons. And the imaginary parts should be less than x to the one minus epsilon. So this is the conjecture for one L function over uh, one L function. Again, there are conjectures, more general conjectures for a product of KL functions over KL functions, and not just for quadratic L functions, but for many other families of L functions. And it turns out that the, uh, the ratios conjecture has applications to um, a wide range of problems, uh, interesting problems in number theory. So I will just mention a few. One of the applications is in uh, computing the so-called one level density of zeros in families of L functions. So this provides a way to study low lying zeros in the families of L functions. This means that we are looking at zeros which are in the family of L functions, zeros which are close to the critical point one half. Um, and if we, um, uh, if we have the ratios conjecture, then we can compute the one level density of zeros for test functions whose Fourier transform, uh, transforms have any support. Um, if we use traditional methods, then we usually can compute the one level density of zeros uh, with the limited support of the Fourier transform. And computing the one level density of zeros um, has uh, applications to non-vanishing questions. So for example, if we're looking at the family of quadratic L functions, uh, there's a conjecture due to Chawla, which says that if we're looking at uh, the value of the L functions at the critical point one half, so we're looking at L one half chi d, where chi d is quadratic, then Chawla's conjecture says that this, uh, this value should never be equal to zero. Uh, and this is a very strong statement. So we are trying to, we are very far from proving that, but we can at least try to say something statistically. So for example, if we look at the family, can we say something that a positive proportion of them are non-vanishing or something of this form? And for example, if we compute the one level density of zeros rigorously, uh, with the limited support of the test function, then one can show that 94% of these uh, L values are non-vanishing, conditional on the generalized Riemann hypothesis. But uh, if we assume the ratios conjecture, then we would get that 100% of these L values are non-vanishing. Um, other than applications to non-vanishing questions, uh, one can also, for example, compute lower order terms for the pair correlations of zeros of zeta. So these lower order terms were previously uh, computed heuristically by Bogomolny and Keating, uh, who used hardy little type arguments to predict these lower order terms, uh, but the computations are pretty involved. So uh, using the ratios conjecture, one can, uh, can make these predictions in, a, in an easier way. Uh, you can also compute mollified moments of zeta or uh, other uh, or mollified moments in other families of L functions. We can obtain conjecture, conjectures for moments of uh, the derivative of the zeta function, and there are many other applications as well. Uh, so it would be very interesting to uh, be able to prove something towards the ratios conjecture. Um, it turns out that in uh, in, terms, in terms of uh, rigorous results, there are no results that I'm aware of for the ratios conjecture. We don't even have upper bounds or lower bounds of the right order of magnitude. And this is in contrast with the situation for computing moments, uh, moments of L functions, uh, where one can usually compute a few small moments for each family of L functions. So for example, if we look at the same family, the family of quadratic L functions, uh, we're summing over these fundamental discriminants. This is what the star on the summation means. Uh, a conjecture due to Keating and Snape based on random matrix theory uh, analogs and later refined by Conway Farmer, Keating, Rubinstein and Snape in the so-called recipe. So their conjecture predicts that the kth moment of L1 half chi d should be asymptotic to x times log x to the k times k plus one over two uh, times this constant ck. 
Uh, and in fact, the cone reform marketing will be signed as next conjecture predicts lower powers of log X uh, in this expansion. And for these moments, one can actually compute a few. So the first two moments are due to Utila's on the origin, computed the second and the third moments. He refined Utila's result on the second moment. Uh, the cubic moment can also be computed using uh, multiple Dirichlet series. This was done by Diakon, Goldfeld, and Hofstein. The fourth moment is due to Shen. Uh, this is conditional on GRH, and it uses some previous ideas used by Sandra Arjan and Young in a different setting. We also have upper bounds of the right order of magnitude. Uh, conditional on the ge uh, generalized Riemann hypothesis due to Sander Arjan. Um, he got almost sharp upper bounds and later Harper uh, improved his results and uh, his result and he got sharp upper bounds. And we also have unconditional lower bounds of the right order of magnitude due to sound and rotting. Uh, so this is different from the ratios conjecture um, uh, case where we don't have upper bounds, we don't have lower bounds, and we don't have asymptotic formulas. Um, and it turns out that the ratios conjecture is closely related to uh, a conjecture due to Gonek from 1989 on negative moments of uh, the Riemann zeta function. So his conjecture says the following. We are fixing k and we're looking at the 2k negative moment of the Riemann zeta function. We have this shift delta over here, so 1 half plus delta. Uh, and we're integrating zeta one half plus delta plus it uh, on the um, up to height t. It turns out that we have one conjecture, uh, depend, uh, we have different conjectures depending on the size of the shift delta. So if delta is not too small, and by not too small, I mean that it's bigger than one over log t, uh, and let's say it's less than one. So recall that this is the range that is relevant for the ratios conjecture. Then the conjecture of Gonex says that this should be asymptotic to t times one over delta to the k squared. And he also makes a conjecture for delta, which is less than one over log t, so delta uh, positive less than one over log t. And it turns out that in this scenario, uh, the conjecture is a little bit more complicated. And we see this transition when k is equal to one half. Uh, actually, uh, there are some uh, random matrix theory computations due to Barry Keating and Forrester Keating, which suggest that maybe uh, Gonex conjecture uh, in this second range, so when the shift is small, it's smaller than one over log t, it might, it might be the case that the conjecture is not quite right. In fact, based on the random matrix theory computations, they seem to suggest that there should be transitions at every uh, k of the form 2n plus 1 over 2. So we should see transitions at 3 halves, 5 over 2, 7 over 2, and so on. And in terms of uh, what we can actually prove towards this conjecture, so Gonek, the, uh, Gonek in the same paper in which he made this conjecture, he obtained lower bounds, which are consistent with the conjecture uh, in this uh, uh, range when uh, delta is bigger than one over log t and is less than one. So uh, when delta is uh, pretty big, it's bigger. And when uh, delta is very small, so delta is less than one over log t, then he has uh, lower bounds when k is uh, less than one half. Um, but nothing is known towards the upper bound part of this argument. Um, so um, in our work in the function field setting, uh, we actually prove upper bounds for these negative moments of, um, uh, for negative moments of L functions in the family of quadratic L functions. Uh, in this kind of range, when the shift is bigger than one over log, of, uh, log uh, of the size of the family, and we obtain almost sharp upper bounds in those ranges. And in fact, in a separate uh, ongoing work with Hang Bui, we also obtained this conjecture of Gonek for the Riemann zeta function. We obtained the upper bound part when, uh, when the shift is between one over log t and one. Okay, so now I will give a little bit of background on the function field setting before describing the problem uh, in this setting. So uh, we will work in fq of t, uh, the ring of polynomials with coefficients in fq. Uh, for us, q will be fixed. 
and we uh, usually have uh, lots of uh, analogies between the number field setting, the integer setting, and this function field setting. So, for example, uh, we can think of positive integers in analogy with monic polynomials. Uh, we can think of the absolute value of an integer in analogy with the norm of a polynomial, which is given by Q to the degree of that polynomial. We think of primes in analogy with monic irreducible polynomials and so on. Um, so we can define many of the objects from the integer setting. We can define them in this uh, function field setting. For example, the analog of the Riemann zeta function is um, this is zeta q of s. So if we think of harmonic polynomials in analogy with integers and the Riemann zeta function is given by the series of one over n to the s when the real part of s is bigger than one, then we can define our zeta q of s to be the sum over monics of one over the norm of f to the s. And we know how to count monics of a given degree. So there are q to the n monics of degree n. So this becomes a geometric series. And then uh, the zeta function is just one over one minus q to the one minus s. So it's a very simple expression. And we have a pole when s is equal to one. Uh, the zeta function, usually in the function field setting, we uh, work with the variable u, which is q to the minus s. Then the zeta function you know, will be given by uh, uh, the, uh, the sum of u to the degree of f when we're summing over monics, and it just has the expression one over one minus q. Then we can define L functions. So if we have a primitive character modulo of polynomial h, then the L, L function associated to this character uh, chi is given by uh, the sum over monics of chi of f u to the degree of f. This has an Euler product over primes not dividing h, similar to the number field setting. And it turns out that the L function has some very nice properties in this uh, setting. So um, if the character chi is primitive, uh, modulo this polynomial h, then L of u chi is actually a polynomial. It has degree at most the degree of h minus one. Um, moreover, it has a functional equation. So for example, if chi is an odd character, we can relate L of u chi to L of one over two u chi bar. We have this quantity here, omega of chi, this is the root number. It has absolute value equal to uh, one. And for us, we will work with quadratic characters. So chi will be equal to chi bar and the root number will be equal to one. So uh, we will get a relationship between L of u chi and L of one over q u chi. Moreover, we also know the Riemann hypothesis is true. Uh, so we know that all the non-trivial zeros of this polynomial lie on the circle of radius one over square root of q. Okay, and then we can formulate the ratios conjecture over function fields. Uh, so this was formulated for quadratic L functions by Andrade and Keating, uh, and their arguments follow the original conjecture of Conry, Farmer, and Zernbauer closely. So here we are looking, we are summing over D uh, in H2G plus one. So this means that D is uh, monic square free of degree or the degree 2G plus one. Uh, they are looking at averages um, of quotients of L of one half alpha plus alpha chi d, L one half plus beta chi d. And again, we get uh, a very similar conjecture to what we would get in the number field setting. So we have one term here, a second term here, and the power saving error term here. So for us, Q is fixed and uh, G, uh, the genus of the family goes to infinity. And the conjecture should hold uh, when uh, the real parts of the shifts are less than one quarter. Again, this is uh, usually for convergence issues for the, for the Euler product. Uh, and we need the shift in the denominator to have real parts bigger than one over G. So this, uh, this one over G in here is exactly the analog of one over log X in the number field setting because q to the g, this is the size of our family, this corresponds to x in the number field setting. Okay, and I want to discuss uh, just a few of the ideas behind these conjectures. Um, 
uh, again, the ideas are very similar. These heuristic ideas are very similar to the ones used in the number field setting. So the first step is to uh, write the L function in the numerator um, as a sum of two Dirichlet series using the approximate functional equation. So I told you that the L function satisfies a functional equation. Using the functional equation, then we can uh, prove an approximate functional equation for DL functions, for DL function, which means that we can essentially truncate if we were to write uh, DL function as a Dirichlet series. Of course, we don't have convergence, but just think of it heuristically. Then if we use the, fun uh, the approximate functional equation, then we can actually truncate at some point in this Dirichlet series and get uh, this type of formula. So uh, L of one half plus alpha chi D, this is given by a uh, sum over polynomials f up to, let's say we're truncating at g, and we have the character chi d of f over f of one half plus alpha, and we have this dual term here, q to the minus 2g alpha, so this part comes exactly from the functional equation, and now our polynomial f uh, has degree up to g minus 1, uh, and we have the character over f to the norm of f to the one half minus alpha. Uh, and then we write the L function in the denominator again as a Dirichlet series using the Mobius function. Um, and we forget everything about convergence. So these are just heuristic arguments. Um, for, the, for the L function in the numerator, so L of one half plus alpha chi D, we forget about the truncations at G and G minus one. So we extend everything to infinity. Um, if we multiply what we get, then the uh, we get two terms, uh, the one coming from this sum here, the second one coming from the second sum. Um, so for example, what do we get for the first sum? We will get a sum over polynomials f and h. Again, I said that we're uh, dropping the condition that the degree of f is less than g. And we have the Mobius function mu of h over the norm of h to the one half plus beta, the norm of f to the one half plus alpha. And we have the sum over square freeze of chi d of fh. We can guess that if fh is a square, uh, then since we have a quadratic character, uh, chi d of fh will be equal to one when fh is co prime to d. So we guess that we should get a main term coming from these terms, fh being equal to a square. Since h is square free, it turns out that this means that f must be equal to some polynomial times h squared. So we replace f by fh squared. And this is the series that we get. So now we will have divided by uh, mu of h divided by the norm of h to the one plus alpha plus beta and f to the one plus two alpha. So you can see that the part with mu of h divided by h to the one plus uh, alpha plus beta, this should give us the zeta q of one plus alpha plus beta inverse. Now we have basically one over the norm of f to the one plus two alpha, this should give us the zeta q of one plus two alpha. And because we have this, uh, also we're twisting by this factor over primes dividing fh of one plus one over p inverse, this comes from counting square freeze of degree two g plus one coprime to fh. So the coprimality condition introduces this Euler factor. This will give us the arithmetic factor A of alpha beta. And if we do exactly the same thing for the second piece involving the Q to the minus 2G alpha, we get the second part of the, uh, the second term in the conjecture. And this kind of heuristic argument can be uh, extended to consider KL functions over KL functions. Okay, so what, uh, what do we prove? So this will be, I'm just focusing here on the simplest case of one L function over one L function. So if we're looking at L of one half plus alpha chi D divided by L of one half plus beta chi D, we obtain uh, an asymptotic formula in the following ranges. So uh, we need the real part of beta. So the shift in the denominator to be bigger than one over uh, essentially square root of G. 
um, here I wrote uh, the result with the real part of beta less than one over log G. Uh, I just focused on this range because this is the more difficult one uh, when the real part of beta is small. If real, the real part of beta is bigger than one over log G, for example, if it's a, uh, if the real part of beta is of constant size, we have something better. Uh, here, the real part of the shift in the numerator alpha goes up to three over 10 minus epsilon, but in fact, this can be uh, improved. We just haven't tried uh, very much. Um, and we get the ratios conjecture in this setting uh, with this type of error term. I should say that uh, the one over square root of G here, so in the uh, number field setting, uh, this would correspond to one over square root of log X. And the ratios conjecture is stated for the real part of beta holding from one over log X up to a constant. So we don't, we can't get uh, um, as close to one over log X, but uh, we need one over square root of log X. Um, and we also have uh, statements for two over 2L functions. So when K is equal to two, we essentially get the ratios conjecture when the real parts of the shifts in the denominator are bigger than one over G to the one quarter. Um, and we have this condition on the shifts in the numerator having real parts uh, less than one over six, but again, this can be improved. Uh, for three over three L functions, we get uh, one over G to the one over six uh, as a lower bound for the shift in the denominator. Um, and again, we have some condition uh, on the real parts of the shift in the numerator. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so... Um, here, the main ingredients in the proof are, so there are two parts of the proof. They're independent of each other. One is obtaining asymptotic formulas for twisted shifted moments of L functions. And this relies on uh, methods which are uh, quite standard by now. Uh, the more difficult part of the proof is that of obtaining upper bounds for negative moments of L functions. Uh, and this builds on work of Sundar Arajan, uh, who uh, got almost sharp upper bounds for moments of the Riemann zeta function, as I mentioned before. His method was refined by Harper using some kind of uh, sieve theoretic inspired ideas. Um, and uh, more recently, Radzivil and Sundar Arajan um, also refined this method uh, further. Um, so what we prove by um, building on these works uh, is that if we have, um, let's say that K is a positive integer bigger than one half, and the shift in the denominator is bigger than one over G to the one over two K, then uh, we get this type of upper bound. So log G over beta to the K times K plus one over two. I should say that, um, what we expect to be sharp is that we have an upper bound of the form one over beta to the k times k plus one over two. So we expect here um, one over beta to the k times k plus one over two. Uh, this is by using uh, gonic type arguments um, to make these uh, conjectures for negative moments of L functions. Um, and if we use gonics, um, Gonex arguments for lower bounds, we should be able to get a lower bound uh, of the form uh, one over beta to the k times k plus one over two. So this is by refining the uh, work of Gonex uh, in this setting. So for the upper bound part, we get almost sharp upper bounds up to this uh, log factor log g to the k times k plus one over two. Uh, any question? Okay, so I will uh, talk a little bit about the proof. I will mostly focus on the proof of this uh, upper bound part. Uh, so we start by writing the the L function in the denominator as a Dirichlet series. So here we are. We have a sum over um, monics. Uh, the Mobius function mu of h uh, divided by the norm of h to the one half plus beta, and we have the character chi d of h. 
And we truncate this Dirichlet series at some point, let's say capital X, which we uh, choose later on. So we get two pieces, two, uh, two terms. We get one term when um, the degree of H uh, is up to X, this parameter capital X. And then we have the second piece when the degree of H is big, it's bigger than X. So we will use different methods to deal with these terms. You can see that for the first term, we essentially, if we uh, switch the sum over H and the sum over D, and then we have this uh, average of L of one half plus alpha chi D multiplied by chi D of H. So these are our uh, twisted shifted moments of L functions. Um, and we will use formulas for those. Um, but the more difficult term to consider is that when um, the degree of H is big, when the degree of H is bigger than X. So what we do is that we actually go back to an expression which involves ratios for this second term. So we use Perron's formula for the sum over H and we rewrite the sum over H in terms of uh, the inverse of an L function. So then uh, our term becomes the integral of uh, this quotient L of one half plus alpha chi D, L of Z over Q to the one half plus beta chi D. And we're integrating over a circle of radius bigger than one. So for example, we can pick, let's say Z to be the, uh, the circle to have radius Q to the real part of beta over two. And then you can see that we would save something like uh, Q to the minus X times the real part of beta over two. And then we need to bound our uh, quotient of L functions. Okay, so for example, we can use Cauchy-Schwartz or we can use Holder's inequality for the sum over D and then use our upper bounds for negative moments of L functions. Uh, so I will focus now on discussing how to get this uh, upper bound for the negative moments. Uh, the key step uh, is an inequality for the log of uh, the absolute value of the L function. So we can think of the L function um, as involving two parts, a part over the zeros of the L function and a part over the primes of the L function. In fact, we can we have an exact formula writing the L function as a product over zeros and a product over primes. Um, if we bound the contribution from the zeros, uh, we get this term over here, 2g over n plus 1 times log of 1 minus q to the minus n plus 1 times beta. So capital N is some parameter that I have flexibility in choosing. Um, and then I have this part involving primes. So we have the degree of P going up to N. Um, we have the character chi D of P divided by the norm of P to the one half plus beta. Uh, this part over here comes from primes square. Um, and then the primes cube and higher, higher powers contribute to this big O of one term here. So then we get an inequality for uh, an upper bound for a one over uh, DL function to the K. So this part uh, involving the primes squared over here, um, this would, uh, if, um, if beta is small, then this is like one over the norm of P. And if we use, for example, the prime polynomials theorem it easily follows that this is like one half times log n. Um, so if we're looking at uh, one over the L function to the K, we would get N to the K over two. So we have this term over here. This is the part coming from the zeros and this is the part coming from the primes. Okay, and here uh, this A of P is minus the cosine of T times the degree of P over log P. So it comes from this real part here. For us, A of P will be, uh, we will just, treat it as one most of the times. Okay, and let's say that we think of capital N as being roughly of size one over beta, where beta is this shift in the denominator. Okay, so now we have this inequality for the inverse of the L function, and we have the exponential of the sum over the primes. So um, what we can do, it's usually hard to work with the exponential as it is, so we want to approximate it by its Taylor series. Okay, so um, 
first we can obtain a pointwise bound for dl function uh, by bounding the sum over the primes we get this kind of upper bound it's not a very good upper bound but it will be good enough for our purposes um, at the first stage and then if we want to work with the exponential of the primes as i said we want to truncate uh, in the Taylor series of the exponential. Okay, so if we have uh, the exponential of t, and let's say that t is less than some l over e squared, where l is even, then we have this inequality, which basically says that the exponential of t can be approximated by the Taylor series uh, truncated at this parameter l. And then what we do is, uh, so we have the sum over the primes p with degree up to capital N. Um, one key observation uh, of Sandararajan in his work on the upper bounds for the positive moments of the, uh, of the Riemann zeta function is that different primes behave differently depending on their sizes. Um, so we want to somehow exploit this thing. So now we, split the primes into many intervals. Let's say that uh, we split them into uh, capital K intervals. And let's think of K as being roughly log of one over beta. Okay, then what do we do? Well, we start with the small primes. So we start with the contribution of, um, from the primes in the first interval I zero. If this contribution is big um, and big is big means that uh, the sum over the primes is bigger than some parameter L0 over K squared, where we will choose the parameter L0 later, then we want to exploit the fact that this doesn't happen too often. So there are not too many discriminants D so that the contribution from small primes is big. So how do we do that? Well, we will bound our, um, our uh, sum over the exceptional set of discriminants by the sum over all the discriminants multiplied by uh, the sum over the primes, k, uh, multiplied by k squared over L0 raised to some uh, parameter S0, which we will choose later. Uh, and how do we choose our parameter L, uh, S0? Well, we are basically here computing moments of the sums over the primes. Um, and we have some restriction on S0 and N0. So N0 is the maximum of a degree of a prime in the interval I0. We have this relationship based on how many moments we can compute uh, related to the sum over, uh, to the size of the discriminant. Okay. So um, then we uh, use Cauchy-Schwarz for the sum over um, the whole set of discriminants. And um, we, we get this first term over here. And then we have the sum over the discriminants um, and the sum over the primes, okay? For the first term, we don't really know uh, what to do other than use the pointwise bound that I told you before for the L function. Um, and we will get some bound from here. But the point is that we want to get a little bit of saving from uh, the sum over the primes. So this is what, we, uh, what will help us in gaining a little bit. Okay, so let's think of L0 in this case as being equal to S0. So S0 is the number of moments that we can compute for the sum over the primes. Uh, L0 is the size of the sum over the primes. Okay, and what we do, so if we focus on the second term uh, involving the sum over the primes, we expand everything out so if we have the sum, now I'm summing over everything of degree 2g plus one, so not just square freeze, I can do that because this is an, up, an upper bound for the sum over square freeze. Um, then we expand everything, we get this 2s0 factorial. And here, just from the combinatorics of the term, we have this uh, multiplicative function nu of f, which is given by, uh, so uh, on, powers of primes p to the a, it's just one over a factorial. Um, we only keep, so what we want to do is just keep the diagonal pieces corresponding to f being equal to a square, because again, if f is a square, then chi d of f is equal to one when d and f are uh, co-prime to each other. 
if f is not a square, then from our condition that, uh, so recall that s0 and 0 is less than or equal to g, if we uh, swap the sum over d and the sum over f, then the sum over uh, d will simply vanish if um, s0 and 0 is bigger than g. Um, so we will only keep the squares and then we get this kind of inequality for the sum over primes. So we get a 2s0 over s0 factorial and then we get a log of n0 which comes from the sum over the primes by using the prime polynomial theorem. So if we put things together, uh, we have, um, what do we get for the upper bound on this exceptional set? So we have this part uh, this is just coming from the pointwise bound, the a priori bound that we use. Uh, and this part, the exponential of minus s0 over two times log of s0, this comes from computing moments of the sum over the primes. Um, so we want this contribution on the exceptional set to be small. So we need to choose our parameter s0 in a suitable way. Uh, and to do that, we want this part S0 over two times log of S0 to beat this first part here. So for example, we can choose our parameter to be equal to what I wrote over here. Um, and recall that we have the condition that S0 and 0 is less than G. So let's, date, let's say that we pick N0 to be uh, roughly G over S0. So this is how we define our first interval. Now, how do we define the subsequent intervals? Uh, I won't talk too much about that. Let's say that we are looking uh, at intervals nj, uh, so that nj is r times nj minus one for some parameter r, which will be chosen later. And let's say that we pick sj. So sj is the number of moments that we can compute to be roughly ag over nj, where a is again, some parameter that we will choose later. And we choose these parameters because we have different various relationships between the SJ and the NJ based on how many moments we can actually compute. Okay, so uh, what, what, what do we do? Uh, we started by saying that if the contribution of the small primes is big, then we exploit the fact that this doesn't happen too often. Um, and we get, basically little o of q to the 2g as a contribution from uh, those discriminants. So now we assume that the small primes actually behave as we would expect them to behave. So that contribution is small. Then we move to the next interval. So now we work with primes, which are in the interval i1. Uh, again, if the contribution from those primes is big, then we should exploit the fact that that also doesn't happen too often. So we proceed as before. Uh, otherwise, if the contribution from the primes in I1 is uh, also small, it's also well behaved, we move on to the next interval I2 and so on. So at the end, we will end up with the contribution from the terms for which the sums over each of the intervals uh, is small. So what do we get? Um, well, we get this first part here coming from the zeros. Um, then we get this term and k to the k over two, this comes from uh, the prime square. And then for each of the, uh, for, for each of the intervals, we truncate the exponential of the sum over the primes by its Taylor series. And we truncate at some point LR, which we uh, choose later on. Okay, and here we are computing moments of the sums over the primes. So what do we get? Again, if we expand everything out uh, for the sum over the primes, we will get this quantity. So when we expand everything for uh, primes in the rth interval, we get the sum over polynomials fr whose primes are all in this r rth interval. Uh, they have at most lr primes. So omega of fr, this uh, indicates the number of primes of multiplicity. And uh, we get k to the number of primes coming from here. We have the character chi d. We have this uh, function, which we think of as being one essentially. And we have this, um, uh, this function, which comes just from the combinatorics uh, of raising this to the LR, uh, LR power. 
Okay, and we proceed exactly like we did before. So if the if the product of the FRs is not a square, then we don't get anything from our condition on the various parameters. So we will only keep those diagonal pieces. Okay, so we will keep the FRs which are square and then the sum over the primes will uh, essentially just be given by this. So recall that we had K to the two times omega of FR, chi D of FR squared, this will be roughly one, mu of FR squared divided by uh, FR to the one plus two beta with the condition that if P divides FR then the degree of P is in IR. Okay, so we can just write an Euler product for this and we bound this function mu of FR squared by mu of FR uh, over two. So this gives us the k squared over two in here. Okay, and we can, uh, for the sum, for the product over the primes uh, with degree up to nk, we get uh, nk to the k squared over two. Okay, so now you see this nk to the k times k plus one over two. And we choose our uh, parameter nk uh, suitably, let's say that nk is roughly uh, one over beta and then we end up with the upper bound for the negative moments. Okay, so in, uh, you can see since we get nk to the k times k plus one over two and nk is roughly log g over beta, then we get the log g over beta to the k times k plus one over two upper bound. And this part is just big O of one with this choice of nk. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Okay, so then I will spend the remaining time talking about the second part, um, the second part of the proof. So uh, I just talked about the uh, the upper bound uh, part. So obtaining upper bounds for negative moments of L functions. Uh, recall that we also had this for, after using um, uh, after using the Dirichlet series for the L function in the denominator and writing it. Uh, involving the Mobius function, we also had the first piece over polynomials h of degree up to capital X. So if we change the sum over d with the sum over h, we essentially need asymptotic formulas for uh, the sum of L of one half plus alpha chi d twisted by this chi d of h. Um, and um, we compute asymptotic, we obtain asymptotic formulas for these. This is related to uh, getting asymptotic formulas just for uh, moments of L functions. So for example, um, uh, if we uh, drop the chi D of H and the shift, then we just need to compute the first moment of uh, L one half chi D. Here H is of small enough degree and the techniques used by now are standard. So for example, we use things like approximate functional equation, Poisson summation, then we use upper bounds for positive moments of L functions um, and so on. So I will describe some of the ideas in the proof. From now on, I will just focus on the moments of the L functions without um, considering the shift and the twist. So um, a few years ago, I computed the, the unshifted, untwisted moments. And then in uh, joint work with Hank Bui, we did the um, twisted moments of L1 half chi D. And we have to uh, redo those computations to allow for a shift as well. Okay, so let's just focus on L of one half chi D. Uh, then if we use the approximate functional equation that I mentioned a little bit before, um, if we think of L one half chi D as being given by the Dirichlet series of chi D of F over square root of F, this of course is not true because of convergence issues, but if we were to write it in that form, um, then what the approximate functional equation tells us is that we can truncate actually in that Dirichlet series um, and we have flexibility in the point where we truncate. Let's say that we truncate at polynomials of degree um, up to G. Then we have this first term chi D of, of F over square root of the norm of F. And we have a second term involving polynomials of degree up to G minus one. So a very similar second term. Okay, and then we sum over polynomials D square free. Um, 
so what happens? Um, well, one observation is that if we have the sum over square freeze, um, then we actually want to write it in terms of sums over monics because it's easier to have the full sum rather than having this uh, sparser sum over square free polynomials. Um, so uh, we rewrite the sum over square freeze as a sum over polynomial C, uh, C dividing F infinity. This means that the primes of C divide uh, F. And then we have a sum over monics of degree 2G plus one minus twice the degree of C. And here we have a similar term with polynomials of degree 2G minus one minus twice the degree of C. Okay, so um, once we have this uh, formula that allows us to express sums over square freeze in terms of sums over monics, we want to use the Poisson summation formula in uh, function fields. So um, how, uh, how do we get the Poisson summation formula in function fields? Well, if we have a Laurent series with coefficients in FQ, uh, then the exponential, this was defined by David Hayes. Um, this is e to the 2 pi i a1 over q, where a1 is the coefficient of 1 over x in the expansion of a. Then we define our generalized Gauss sum in analogy with what we would do over, um, over number fields. So it's a sum over u mod f of chi f of u e of uh, u v over f. And then the Poisson summation formula takes the following uh, form. So let's assume that uh, F, this is the modulus of the character, has even degree, then uh, the sum of chi F of H, so we are summing over H of degree M and uh, little f has degree N, then we get essentially a sum on the right hand side of size N minus M. Okay, so this has the advantage that if, uh, for example, M is big, so if we have a long sum over H, then doing the Poisson summation formula translates that to a sum of length roughly N minus M, and if M is big, then N, N minus M will be small, so we will have a smaller sum and we will have better control on the error terms. Okay, so what do we do? Well, we use um, the approximate functional equation. We get this first term and the second term, which is very similar. And for, um, for each of these terms, we use um, the formula, which allows us to write the sum over square freeze in terms of sums over monics. And for the sum over the monics, uh, we do Poisson summation. Okay, so then we get the sum over uh, C, whose primes divide F. Um, we have this first term corresponding to V is equal to zero, G of zero chi F. And then we essentially get a sum over V of degree up to the degree of F minus two G plus twice the degree of C. We generally think of the degree of C as being very small. So this would be uh, degree of F minus two G. One key observation is that uh, the Gauss sum uh, is non-zero if and only if uh, f is a squared, the Gauss sum is zero, so g of zero chi f. Uh, and in this case, g of zero chi f is uh, phi of f. This is the Euler phi function in the function field setting. So we rewrite uh, this term um, in this way. So we have g of zero chi f and f must be a square. So let's write f as L squared. Um, so, um, and the g of zero chi f in this case is phi of f. So it's phi of L squared. So this is what we get for, um, for our Dirichlet series. And now the degree of L goes up to roughly g minus one over two. So this is just focusing on the second term from the approximate functional equation. And we have standard techniques to evaluate this term. So for example, we look at the generating series of uh, this and we use Perron's formula. Uh, so this will be the integral over a small circle around the origin, let's say a small circle of radius one less than one over Q. Um, and if we look at the generating series, uh, we get that the generating series is equal to some product over primes C of U, and we have a double pole um, at one over Q. So we divide by one minus Q U squared. And this is our, um, our function C of u. And this has uh, an analytic continuation when uh, u is less than two. 
And in fact, there is a barrier when you uh, reach its Q. So we cannot uh, analytically continue it be uh, beyond uh, the circle of radius Q. Okay. Um, so since we cannot do that, since this has an analytic continuation for um, radius less than Q, if we were to do the usual thing, so we expand the contour of integration, um, we evaluate the polet, the residue of the polet one over Q and bound the contour on the, uh, on the new, uh, bound the integral on the new contour. So we are initially integrating along this small circle. We have the polet one over Q here. And we can shift, let's say, to a circle of radius u, which is q to the one minus epsilon. Then we get the main term from the pole at one over q. And on this uh, bigger circle here, we would get an error of size q to the g plus g epsilon. And there is no way we can do better than that because there is a natural barrier to how much we can shift the contour. So instead, we leave this main term in this integral form. Um, and we hope that it will somehow simplify later on. Um, so now we need to focus on the other terms um, that we get. So uh, if we sum over, uh, uh, let's say that we fix a polynomial V, which is non-zero, and we sum over F, then we essentially get, if we write an Euler product, then we essentially get the L function L of W chi V. So um, these Gauss sums are multiplicative, so we can write an Euler product for those. We get the L function here. And you can see that if V is a square, since we have a quadratic character, um, we will have a pole when W is equal to one over Q because the L function will be related to the zeta function. Okay, so um, we focus on the squares. And if we do that, what happens? Then uh, I, uh, we're looking at this first term here coming from squares. Um, we essentially can compute the lower order term of size q to the 2g plus 1 over 3 times uh, some linear polynomial in g. And we get exactly. Um, minus the integral that we had for the main term. But now we are integrating over a bigger circle. So in fact, if we put these two things together, they uh, magically combine. So for mg minus one, we had the integral over this small circle here. We have the pole outside. For uh, the squares, for v is equal to a square, we have the integral over a bigger circle and uh, the pole is inside one over Q. So when we put them together, we get exactly the residue at one over Q. And we have this lower order term of size Q to the 2G plus one over three uh, times a linear polynomial. And then uh, to bound, for example, the contribution from V uh, not being a square, we use things like um, either the Lindelof bound for L functions, or we can use uh, upper bounds for positive moments. Of L functions. And we know how to get upper bounds for positive moments and it's uh, easier than to get upper bounds for negative moments. Okay, so, um, um, so this gives uh, this gives the main ideas of proof behind computing the um, the moments of the L functions. I should say that when we um, when we compute the twisted shifted moments, then we do get these lower order terms of a similar form q to the two g plus one over three times some polynomials. So you so you might wonder if these lower order terms contribute anything uh, in the ratios conjecture, if it gives us any kind of lower order terms in the ratios conjecture. And the answer is, um, we probably can get lower order terms in the ratios conjecture in this way, but our error terms are um, pretty big. So let me go back to the slide where we had our uh, main result. So over here, notice that we essentially have an error term of size Q to the minus G times the real part of beta times some constant C. 
So let's think of the real part of beta as being one over square root of G. So we're essentially saving Q to the minus square root of G times some constant. So uh, we don't have a big saving and we wouldn't be able to see any lower order terms with this method. So essentially the error term here comes from obtaining upper bounds for negative moments of our functions. Okay, so I think I will stop here.